Okay, I've just handed out the take home exam, which is entitled uh, Homework 4 Continued. And it is a continuation of Homework 4, so if you've done that, this shouldn't be too bad. Uh, let me go over it with you. First of all, notice that at the top, this is an exam, not a homework. It says, I pledge my honor that I have neither given nor received aid on this exam. Okay, what this means is that whereas up to this point you've been allowed to consult but not copy, but you could ask questions, talk, work with each other because the main purpose of the homework assignments was to teach rather than to uh, evaluate. But in this case, uh, teaching is also part of it, but evaluation is more. So, so from this point on, you cannot speak to another person about this exam. Although you can raise questions in class if you want, it's fair as long as everybody has the same information. Now what the uh, uh, exam says is, uh, well there were three questions in homework four. So this one has questions four, five, six, and seven. So four says, write a program that simulates the exhaustive service vacation model with FIFO Q discipline. So you've already done theory on that. So this asks you to write a program to simulate it. Use the program to estimate the probability that the waiting time lies between one and three and compare the simulation value with the theoretical value calculated in part three of homework four. Run the simulation for 100,000 customers. Fill in the following table. So actually the purpose of this is to check your simulation. So you have a table like this. This is question four on the exam. There are three things. There's utilization, expected waiting time. So there's utilization, expected value of the waiting time, and the probability that the waiting time lies between one and three. And then there is theory. and simulation, theory, simulation, theory, simulation. Now, um, this you've already done through theory. And if you were smart, you would have written a simulation at the same time to make sure that your theory was correct. Okay, but now I'm asking you to write the simulation, run it, and hopefully you'll get the same answer here as you got here. Uh, I don't think I asked you to calculate the expected waiting time before, but that's easy. So you have the, uh, uh, the tools to do that. Again, you run the simulation and check. And of here, utilization, of course, uh, you know that the utilization depends only on the arrival rate and average service time, which in this case would be 80%. And so the simulation should also give you 80%. And that answer, of course, in theory, is independent of the vacation time. It doesn't matter what the vacations are. That doesn't, that doesn't uh, affect the utilization of the server. Okay, so that was, that's question number four. Now question number five asks you to look at the same model, but now it says, suppose that the vacation lengths, which we'll call V, are given by the sum X plus Y. Note that X is a lowercase x, and so this is going to be a constant. Actually, it'll be treated as a parameter because what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to uh, compute uh, waiting times uh, as a function of this constant uh, part of the vacation. So the vacation is going to consist of two parts, a constant part plus a variable part. And in the variable part, the definition is that the probability that y takes the value 1 is equal to 0.9 and the probability that y takes the value 11 is equal to 0.1. This should look familiar to you from an earlier problem. I'm using the same distribution as before. Okay, it says, as in part 3, assume that the service times are exponential with mean value 1 and the arrivals follow a Poisson process with arrival rate 0.8. Fill in the following tables. As before, run the simulation program for 100,000 customers. Okay, 
Here were the tables. Now, I just hope this all makes sense, because as I say, I just did this. Um, let's see, I think I'll use a different color here. So the first table uh, asks you to run it for different values of x. So the values of x I'm choosing are 0, 1, 2.5, and 4. The reason I chose those values is I think that those are interesting values. However, remember that you're not constrained by the problem to do, to do um, uh, uh, no more than this. You can run, in, run other values, do anything you want. The ones I want you to write down so I'll be able to check because I'll know what the numbers are, are these. But if you want to add in more, fine. I mean, the more you do, the more you get out of this, the better. Now, in this case, I want you to calculate the utilization. And the expected value of the waiting time. So this is really no different than what you did before except that the, um, before the vacation lengths were constant, and here the vacation length has a constant plus a variable. Now, um, uh, in each case, there are two pieces, theory and simulation. So that's the table. Now. There's another table. Uh, let's see. It says uh, fill in the following tables. OK, let me draw the other table. I think I'll draw that over here. The other table looks like this. Get a good color here. Here we have values of t, and uh, t is going to run from one, from zero to fifteen. Although I just chose those numbers rather arbitrarily. And uh, what you want to calculate is. First of all, take the case in which x is equal to 0. Remember that x is the constant part of the vacation length. And then uh, calculate the theoretical value and the simulation value. And uh, let's see. the. Um, OK, as it stands, I guess I made a mistake in the statement of the problem. This is why I want to do this. I'll get back to this in a minute. I didn't tell you what to put in this table. OK, in this table, you're supposed to put in the utilization and the expected value of the waiting time. Here I want you to put in something. And uh, let's see, what is the something? It says, um, fill in, yeah. What's supposed to be in the table here is the probability that the waiting time is less than or equal to t. So. What you're calculating here is the distribution function of the waiting times. So this is the probability that the waiting time is less than or equal to 0, or 0, uh, if the constant part of the vacation length is 0, and then 1, and 2, and so forth. In other words, this is going to be something that, I'm, that in the next question I'm asking you to graph. So I'm asking you to graph it and to show the, um, uh, the, some of the specific values so that I can check the right answers. So I'm asking you to do this for x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 2.5, and x equals 4. So in each case, there are going to be two columns, theory and simulation. So first of all, uh, you take your program, which simulates um, the um, vacation model, and you run it four times. You have to run it for vacations in which 
the constant part of the vacation is 0 or 1 or 2.5 or 4. And for each of those times, when you run it, you're going to run it for 100,000 customers, and then the simulation is going to produce some values for you. In particular, I want to produce the um, uh, utilization of the server, and I want it to produce the mean value of the waiting time. And then you compute those things theoretically. So this corresponds to four different simulation runs. Now, so does this, because when you run this thing four times, each column corresponds to one of those runs. So this column is the run where the constant part is 0, the constant part is 1, the constant part is 2.5, the constant part is 4. So you only have to run the simulation four times. Now, when you run it, you not only want to calculate the utilization and the average waiting time, but you want to calculate the waiting time distribution function, which means for each t, you want to calculate the probability that the waiting time is less than or equal to t. So that means that in your simulation, you have to have, in this case, 15 divisions and count the number of times that the uh, waiting time was less than or equal to 0 and the number of times it was less than or equal to 1 and so forth. So even though there's lots of values of t that's still done only, only uh, each column is a single run of the simulation. So you have to run the simulation four times, each time for 100,000 customers. So that, that, uh, that shouldn't be too uh, time consuming. Then question number six says draw the graph of the expected value of the waiting time versus x. x, remember, is the constant part of the vacation length. So we're going to take that as a parameter. So it's going to run from 0 on up. And what I've asked you to do is to put in this table the exact values you get from the theory and the simulation when x is equal to 0, 1, 2.5, or 4. But when you actually uh, plot this, I don't want you to plot it just for those values because it's, a, it's a, uh, a smooth curve. So you should have something like this, some curve. Now, around that curve, since you also have the theoretical values, you could, uh, for say, uh, the value 1, uh, 2.5, uh, 0, and 4, uh, you might as well put in what the simulation values gave you, although that's really not the point of the curve. I, want, I just want to see exactly what the shape of the curve looks like. Then question number 7. Keep forgetting that the blue one is the hardest one to erase. Got such problems here. Okay, what do we got? Blues, the browns you can't see, the black doesn't look like it has enough ink in it. This is more like a purple, maybe. Okay, number seven says on a single set of axes, draw the graphs of the probability that the waiting time is less than or equal to t. Uh, versus T. All right, so similarly as with 6, what you're doing here is you're going to compute this thing to get a smooth curve as a function of T. But uh, 16 of those particular values were already computed here. Now, it may be, since I haven't done this, that uh, I haven't really picked the right range of values of t. And so as soon as somebody does this, let me know how it comes out. Because maybe I should have run it, say, from 0 to 8, for example, and uh, asked you to plot values, um, uh, uh, say, instead of with a unit spacing of 1, unit spacing of 1 half. So I just sort of roughly did this in my head and said, well, that's a good range. But once you actually compute the thing, you'll see whether that's a good range or not. So this is a distribution function, and uh, there are going to be four different cases. The case with x equals 0, x equals 1, and so forth. Now, a distribution function, well, obviously, for t negative, it's going to be 0. And uh, otherwise, it's going to then increase, be monotonically increasing from 0 to 1. That's what a distribution function is. Now, we know that. Uh, for a vacation model, you already solved this in the last homework problem. The probability of waiting 
uh, zero is zero. You always weight a positive amount, which means that the probability of weighting less than or equal to zero is uh, zero, which means that um, the graph is going to start here at the origin. And then it's going to rise somehow and be asymptotic to 1 as t goes to infinity. But there are going to be four cases. I'm asking you to do it for x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 2.5, and x equals 4. So there'll be four curves, all starting here and all asymptotic to here. But I don't know what they look like. I don't know whether they look like this or whether some crosses another one or what. And as I say, I picked these values because I think these are interesting values. So it may be that there's a crossover point someplace. It may be that, that uh, none of them cross, but they may not turn out to be in the order given here. They could be in some different order. Uh, that is, it might go 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, 0, 1, 2.5, 4, 0, 2.5, 1, 4. I mean, who knows? Of course, you would expect that the curves would not cross and that they would be ordered in the same order as here. I don't know whether it would start and go from uh, top down or bottom up, but you would expect that they would not cross and that they would not be out of order, so to speak, in terms of increasing values of x. But that remains to be seen when you, when you uh, draw the graph. And of course, if you don't know what the answer is supposed to be, well, uh, that's what the simulation is for. You work back and forth between the two, so uh, you should be able to figure out what, what is right and then make the theory match the simulation or the simulation match the theory. Or somehow or other have these things converge so that you're, you've convinced yourself that you've in fact uh, uh, done the problem correctly. And that's it. So this problem I think is not as difficult as the previous problem. Should take less time I think. Um, and, uh, but you have to do it yourself. And also, I'm really not sure because I haven't done it. So this is partly for my benefit. I'm interested to see how these answers come out. OK, any comments or questions about that? When does it do? Well, um, there's a date at which the grades are due, which is a Monday. I think it's what's that, probably three weeks from this coming Monday. Well, whenever it is, the grade to do on Monday, I have to be able to, I have to have time to grade these things. So let's make it due the Friday before the grades are due. However, I would like it sooner. Like if you get it tomorrow, that would be great. The sooner you get it, the better it is for me because I can grade it faster and then I can see whether there, there are any pitfalls or anything that I overlooked so that I can then announce that to other people. So there's a, there's a benefit to me and therefore a benefit to you of getting it in early. So when I, if you get it in early, then, uh, then in a sense, there'll be more slack in the grading than if you get it in late, because people who get it in late presumably will have had not only more time, but they'll also have had the benefit of, uh, of the insights that I, because of, of uh, uh, hints that I would have given during the class based on what the earlier people did when they handed theirs in. So get it in as soon as possible. If you get it done a week early, say don't hold it until uh, uh, the latest date is po of possible, just get it in. Okay, but I'm giving as much time as I as I possibly can, which is the Friday before the grades are due. Okay, anything else? Does this this look uh, clear? Okay. We, we cannot ask you any questions about this. No, you can ask me questions. It's best if you ask the questions in class so that then everybody hears what the question is. Unless you think it shouldn't be asked. Related to this exam. To the exam. Anything else, of course, you can ask questions. Related to the exam, if it's a question of interpretation, if I made a mistake, for example, I didn't realize until just now that I forgot to say what is in the table. This is what I want in the table. So if that kind of question, then of course ask it. If it's a question that relates to your particular how you solve the problem. You have, a, you have a problem that's particular to you, then ask it and I can decide whether I want to answer it or not. It might, I mean, this is a, um, well, I'm trying to give you a grade for the whole course. Of course, 
you already have 90% of your grade in a sense because you've already done all these homework problems and most people have done them all very well. So that's, that's, that's very good. So the main thing here that's different from the other homework problems is that this one you're supposed to do on your own. Uh, but nevertheless, if you ask me a question, I can decide whether to answer it or not. And if it's a question that uh, I answer that gives you a hint, then maybe I'll just answer it in public so that everybody has the same hint. Because there's no value to me or to you to have people get stuck and not be able to do it. So I, I, don't, I don't want that to happen. I want everybody to get it done and do it right, actually. That would be the best. All right, so if you get stuck at a point where you simply can't go on, it's better to ask. If I tell you and don't tell other people, and then you solve the problem with the hint, and they solve the problem without the hint, then of course they deserve more points. That'll just be my judgment as to how much the hint is worth. But definitely, if you need a hint, uh, if without the hint you can't solve it, you're going to hand in a blank piece of paper, then don't do that. <laughs> ask me whatever is necessary. Okay. Okay. No limitation on the program. What was that? In the, the simulation program, you can write it in any language. Sure, yeah. Okay. All right, so now uh, we're back to uh, queues served in cyclic order. And um, let me pass out a paper. Here's the way I'm going to work this. There are several papers that I've been involved in. The first one was published in the Bell System Technical Journal, which no longer exists. The Bell System no longer exists. Uh, has gone through several uh, uh, stages. Went through AT&T. Now it's Lucent. In any event, uh, the Bell, this was when I was at Bell Labs. This paper was published in the Bell System Technical Journal in 1969. So that was quite a while ago. And this paper was actually the first paper that solved the problem of queues served in cyclic order in which there were more than two queues and there were no approximations. And uh, so this sort of started what is now called polling models. And um, there were two papers written, one in 69, one in 70. And then they sort of sat dormant for a while. I'll give you a little bit more of the history as we go through it. Uh, but I've been working on this subject more or less uh, since 69, actually since 68. And um, uh, recently some new results have come out. So what I want to do is, well, the results are sort of like this. The main results are first of all in 69 and 70. Then the next result was in 85. 85 was the vacation model which was solved in general, although the special case of the vacation model for exhausted service was solved in 70 as part of this, uh, in one of these papers. And then there was some work that appeared recently in 95 and 96 uh, that uh, provides some more insight uh, into the relationship between the queues in which the switch over times are zero and when they're not. And so I'm, I'm going to try and cover all of these things, although of course I can't cover detail because some of the detail gets complicated. But I want to go through the main pieces. So I have here a copy of the Bell System Technical Journal paper from 69. And so let me pass that out. And then the lecture will be key to some of the equations that are in here. Um, let's see, these were expensive, so you want to share it? Okay. Okay. Okay, so according to the uh, abstract here, it says that we're going to consider two models. Uh, one is called exhausted service, one is called uh, gated service. These were the first time these, the words exhaustive and gated service were used, although now people call these polling models instead of saying uh, cyclic order. Cyclic order tends to turns out to be a special case because you don't have to consider cyclic order. There are other uh, periodic orders you could consider. Um, the exhaustive service model is simpler and more basic than the gated model, so let's just worry about that. 
And uh, let me draw the picture of what's going to, what's happening here. Now the strategy is first I'm going to do the general case as in the paper. But then I'm going to do a specific case because I think it's easier to understand. And then I'll go back to the general case. In other words, I'm trying to do it the way in which, uh, at least for my brain, it's the easiest to see. So we're going to have n cues. And the server switches from Q to Q in cyclic order. Now each Q, the ith Q, has its own arrival rate, lambda sub i, Poisson input, and has its own distribution function of service times, h sub i. So in isolation, each one of these Qs is an MG1 Q. Or you could take the viewpoint that it's an MG1 Q with vacation because the server serves the, the Q, the station, until there are no more customers waiting. That's exhausted service. And then it switches instantaneously to the next queue and then the next one and so on. So while it's serving all the other queues in the, in the sequence, from the viewpoint of the target queue, the server is on vacation. And in fact, that's the strategy for solving it. Now, uh, let's uh, half, half of these, these general papers, things that are complicated, are notation. So first of all, let me define Q sub i of k and t. Let's see, it's written with a semicolon in the, in the paper. And that is the probability that during an interval of length t, exactly k customers arrive at qi. So instead of having to write lambda sub i t to the k over k factorial, e to the minus lambda sub i t for each value of i from 0 to n and each value of k from 0 to infinity, I'm simply going to use this uh, notation. Okay, so in this case, the k value runs from 0 to infinity. That's the number of possible arrivals. And the i value runs from 0 to n, where n plus 1 is the number of q's. So I called the target Q, in a sense, Q0. Actually, I probably should have called it Q1, and, and then this N would be the number of Q's. Now the number of Q's is capital N plus 1. OK, now the main thing here, the big deal, right at the beginning, is equation number 1. And so what I'll do is I'll write down equation number 1, and I'll try and explain the terms as I go along. So first I'm going to write it down in general, and then I'll take a special case in which there are three Q's where it's actually, you can actually do the arithmetic. So first of all, we're going to define P sub I of N1 dot 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 N sub cap N. Okay, so I've got to say what this is. This is the joint probability that at a switch point, I have just left QI, and there are N1 customers in the first Q to its right, and N2 customers in the second, and so on. OK, so this is tricky, because these, these uh, variables are going to, in a sense, shift around. So first of all, it's a joint probability. So what's a switch point? I'm going to define a switch point, just like in the, um, I think we've already discussed this. The switch point is registered whenever the, uh, whenever the server leaves a queue. And it leaves a queue only when that queue is empty, exhausted service. So embedded in all time, there are going to be a set of instants at which I leave this queue, and I leave this queue, and I leave this queue, and so forth. Now suppose, for example, that when I leave this queue, this queue is empty. Since we have uh, service times, that's we have switchover times that are zero, then the server would immediately jump from here to here, and so it would register a switchover time here and a switchover time here at the same instant. So the switchover times can overlap, but they're considered to be, for the purposes of this analysis, distinct. And as the server moves, it registers these switchover times. And if you look at the 
the set of all possible, of all switchover times, then this is the probability that if I pick the switchover time at random, when the, the server has just registered that switchover time moving from QI. Okay, so as the queue moves around, as the server moves around, this is the probability that at the switchover time in question, at the switch point in question, the server has just left this queue, in Q, what I'm calling QI, in which case, of course, the number of customers waiting is zero because of exhausted service. So when it leaves here, we know there are zero customers there, and I want the probability that there are N1 customers here, and N2 customers here, and N3 customers here, and so forth, and NN customers there. Okay, so that's the, uh, we're going to write these uh, probabilities. Now there's going to be capital N plus uh, one of these for each I. Uh, no, N of these. Let's see. Uh, yeah, let's leave that. For each i, there's going to be one of these probabilities. In addition, each one of these indexes runs from 0 to infinity. OK, now, how can this vector arrive? The vector has uh, n, capital N plus 1 elements, namely that and each of these. OK, so the first thing is, uh, let's write the term for the probability that the previous switch point was from QI minus 1. And at that time, at the instant that the switch point occurred, there were J customers waiting here and K1 customers waiting here, and K2 customers waiting here, and so forth, and K sub N minus 1 customers waiting here. And we're going to take J to be at least 1. And then we'll do the 0 term separately. OK, so first of all, I'm going to have a sum here. And the first value of the sum is that the, is the J is going to run from 1 to infinity. And in addition, I'm going to sum over various values of the k's. So let me write that here. k1 runs from 0, and I'll put the upper lim limit in in a minute. And k sub n minus 1 runs from 0. OK, now I'm not done yet, of course. There's another big term. I'll put that term right here in an integral. OK, so first of all, if I'm at a switch point, what's the probability that the switch point is from QI and there's N1 here, N2 here, N3 here, and so forth? Well, one way that can happen is the previous switch point was from QI minus 1, and at that time the state, the number of customers was J, K1, K2, K3, and so forth. Now, if that happened, I have to multiply this by the probability, the conditional probability, that if this was the previous state at the switch point, that at the next switch point, the state would be this. In other words, enough customers have arrived during the time the server spends here so that the state changes from that to that. So first of all, how much time do I spend here? Well. If when I switched from here, I found J, and J was at least 1, that means that I stop here and I start to serve those customers and all their descendants. So how much time do I spend there? Well, we already know now that that length of time is going to be a J busy period. So this J says that the length of time that I'm going to spend here if when I arrive there I find J customers is equal to the sum of J busy periods. That's the J busy period. So it's a J fold convolution of the distribution function of the busy period with itself. And the subscript I means that this busy period is for the particular parameters lambda I and H I. Okay, so this is the probability then that when I get to this queue, I spend exactly t. 
Now, if I spend exactly t, then uh, what must happen? Well, first of all, uh, this k1 is going to become n1. Remember that I'm going to serve all of these j, and then the number that were here was k1, but when I switch from here to here, that's going to be n1. So therefore, uh, n1 minus k1 must arrive here, and n2 minus k2 must arrive here, and n3 minus k3 must arrive here, and so forth. OK, so here is q sub i plus m. Now, I'm going to, this is the probability that to q number i plus m, I have exactly n sub m minus k sub m new arrivals in time t. And I'm going to take the product of that as m runs from 1 to capital N minus 1. I'm not done yet. This is going to be a term here. OK, so when m is equal to 1, this is the probability that if that's qi, that's qi plus 1. So to qi plus 1, n1 minus k1 arrive, times the probability that to qi plus 2, n2 minus k2 arrive, and so forth. So that takes care of everybody up to n minus 1. And then I need to worry about qn, which is this guy right here. But I know that, um, um, that uh, at the time I left here and started here, this Q was necessarily empty. And therefore, when I start here, there will be a certain number of customers here if that number is exactly the number that arrived during the service times of the customers that were served here. So in other words, the last term here is Q sub I plus cap N of um, uh, little n sub cap n uh, semicolon t. The paper would have been better. This were obviously written to be read rather than to be explained, or I wouldn't have used n and n because I got to keep on saying little n or big n. So I should have used something else. But when they're written, there's no, no trouble making that distinction. OK, now I have to integrate that over all values of t from 0 to infinity. Of course, this term multiplies that term. So that's the first term in my uh, equation number one in the paper. Now, this doesn't include everything because I've started here with j equals 1. Suppose j is equal to 0. That is, it's possible that when I switched from here, um, uh, well, let me, let's say this again. OK, j is the number of customers that are here when I switch from here to here. Now, this is, well, I, let me say that again. Maybe I said that wrong. This j is the number that are waiting here when I switch from here. Now, if the, when I switch from here, if the number that was waiting here was 0, because I've summed it from 1 to infinity, if the number here was 0, then I wouldn't spend any time here. I would immediately go to here. So I have to take into account what happens if the number here was 0, in which case I would spend 0 time. So I'll add on another term. Here it is. Plus p sub i minus 1. OK, that's the probability that the previous switch point was from q i minus 1. And at that time, there was 0 in q i. And OK, now if there was 0 from q i, if there was 0 waiting here, then Whatever was waiting at this switch point will be exactly what's waiting at this switch point, because the length of time it'll take me to go from here to here was 0. So that means that if this, uh, these values are n1 through nn, then at this time, I must have those same values waiting in the other queues. 
So that means that this is going to be n1 through n sub cap n minus 1. Okay, but this term is going to appear only under certain conditions. So let me write down what those are. Okay, those conditions are first of all that not all of these guys are zero. Because if everybody was zero when I switched from here, then I'm not going to go through here and come back in zero time. Because if I do that, then I would go through again in zero time and I would have the problem that I would have an infinite number of cycles in a finite period of time. So I have to make the rule that says that I'm going to have zero switchover times, but if ever I register a switch point and the system is completely empty, instead of having the server race through here at infinite speed, an infinite number of times in a finite time interval, what I'll do is I'll simply say the server will stop. So somehow or other the server knows what's waiting and if at the, at the time of the switch point the system is completely empty, the server just uh, sits there. He um, just waits around, he doesn't do anything, he sits in, in uh, uh, limbo, let's say, and then what happens is he doesn't move until a customer arrives. When a customer arrives to a previously empty system, he has to arrive someplace. And wherever he arrives, then the server immediately jumps to that guy without registering any switch points, and then he uh, everything starts again from that point. And he doesn't register a switch point until he switches from there. Okay, so so that's that's, those are the rules under which I'm, uh, I'm handling this. Now you can see that, that there's a difficulty here because of this, um, uh, this pole, this um, uh, instability that occurs when the system is empty. So I have to decide what to do. And that's part of the difficulty that's haunted this subject for many years in which now people are just beginning to understand, which is that the Another way of looking at the model is to say, well, suppose that I have a small length of time or some arbitrary length of time that's a switch over time. As long as that's positive, then I don't have to worry about this. And so what, one way to solve the problem is to assume that the switch over times are non-negative, excuse me, are non-zero or positive variables. And then take the limit as the length of the switchover time goes to zero to get the zero switchover time model. But of course, when you take the limit, the whole thing is going to fall apart unless you do it carefully. Because when you take the limit, what you're going to find is you're going to find that everything is dominated by the empty, uh, uh, by the, by the, uh, the uh, trivial case. Because as the switchover time gets smaller and the server gets faster, uh, in the limit, it's almost always going to find the system empty. Okay, so we have to worry about that difficulty and, and uh, there's two parts of the difficulty. One is the difficulty here and the other is the difficulty in the model that presumably is more general in which the switchover times are not required to be zero and then the connection between those two models because you want to be able to get the zero model from the non-zero model and that turns out to be non-trivial but actually turns out to be very insightful and that's one of the places where current research is. Okay, so to have this term included, then the first thing I want is I want at least one of, the, uh, of these guys to be not empty. Okay, so the way I'll handle that is this. I'm going to define this uh, delta, which I'm going to terp interpret to say that delta of something is zero if that something is not zero and delta of zero is one. All right, so this is just a definition here. Delta of x equals zero if x does not equal zero and is equal to one if x equals zero. Okay, so now I'm going to take delta of the sum as uh, m runs from 1 to cap n minus 1 of little n sub m. Okay, now, if any of these n's 
if any of these ends right here are, uh, if they're all zero, then this thing will be one. And in that case, I don't want this term to appear. So I will uh, subtract this from one and multiply that times that. And then I will multiply this by delta of little n sub big N. OK, so let me explain this. And then there's still another term. This piece right here says that this term will not appear in the equations if all of those ends are 0, if all of those guys are 0. Because if they are, then the system is completely empty, and then I want to consider something differently. So I want at least one of these guys not to be 0. As long as one of these guys is not 0, then the server will switch right through here to wherever the, the, Q, the, the station is that has customers waiting, and then it'll stop there, and it'll start working on those customers. OK, so this term assures that, that this probability is going to appear in the equations uh, uh, only if at least one of those guys is not 0. And the second piece is that at the time I switch from here, if this guy is 0, then whenever I start immediately, whenever I start again, since no time will have elapsed, this guy must still be 0. And so I want this term to appear only when, the, when this term over here is a 0. And so I indicate that by multiplying by this delta. So when, when little n sub big N is 0, then this term appears. And when it's not 0, this term does not appear. OK, let me do the last term, and then I'll go back over this. And then I'll do it for a simpler case. OK, now the last term. Now what happens when, uh, suppose that when I uh, uh, switched previously, the system was completely empty. OK, what's the probability that at a switch point, the system is completely empty? <laughs> All right, now if the system is completely empty, when, I, when the server finishes serving whatever queue it was working on, then the assumption is that the server goes into limbo and does not register a switch point and just sits there and does nothing until, the, uh, until a customer arrives. And when a customer arrives, the server immediately jumps to that queue. OK, now, what's the probability that, uh, uh, that at a switch point, the system is completely empty? That's the probability that the last switch point was at QK and the system is completely empty summed over all K. All right, so that's the probability that at a switch point, um, uh, the system is empty. Now. Lambda i over lambda is the probability that if the system becomes empty, the next arrival will occur at qi. And in that case, that is, the next arrival occurs at qi, then what that means is the server immediately jumps to that q and starts the cycle all over again. Of course, when it jumps to that q, we know that all the other q's are empty, and we know that the length of time it's going to spend here is going to be exactly a one busy period because it's going to start serving as soon as a customer arrives. OK, so that means that I will jump from uh, uh, the previous switch point to this state. And the probability of that is going to be the probability that during a one busy period at QI, I have exactly n1 customers arrive here, n2 here, n3 here, n4 here, and so forth. So that probability is the product as I run as m runs from 1 to n of q sub i plus m. Okay, that's this guy right here. Same kind of thing as this. N sub m. T. 
and that integral runs from zero to infinity. Okay, so now I have to solve these equations. Looks hopeless, but we'll see shortly that it's actually going to work right out. Okay, so let me, let me review this again and hope I say it right. Of course, you can study it because it's all written down in detail right in front of you. Okay, so we want to calculate the probability that at a switch point, the switch point that I'm looking at is a switch point from QI and there are N1 customers in QI plus 1, N2 customers in I plus 2, and so forth. So how can that happen? Well, one way it can happen is that the previous switch point be from QI minus 1, and at that time, the number of customers waiting in Q1, in QI, excuse me, was J, and the number of customers waiting here was K1 and K2, and so forth where the j we're going to assume is at least 1. Now, if the j, the number waiting here when I switched from here, was at least 1, then the server is going to stop here and it's going to spend some time serving those j customers and all of their descendants. And how much time is that going to be? Well, that's going to be exactly a j busy period where the busy period parameters are for qi, that is the lambda i and the hi. Now, during the time that I spend serving the J customers there and all of their descendants, in order to go from this state to this state, I must have during that time exactly N1 minus K1 arriving here and N2 minus K2 arriving here and so forth. So that's this product of N1 minus K1, N2 minus K2 and so forth. And finally, at this queue, now I know that at the previous switch point when I left this queue, if it was a switch point, this queue must have been empty. And therefore, um, uh, in order to go from this state to this state, whatever number of customers are waiting here, all of those customers must have arrived during the time I spent serving here. So that probability is given by the probability that during this J busy period at QI, the number of arrivals to this Q is exactly that number right there. Okay, that's actually the easy term in a sense. It's the easiest one to understand. Now, what about the case in which the J is not, uh, is not positive? Suppose the J is zero. If the J is zero, let's first take the case in which the J is zero, but all the other guys are not all zero because if the J is zero and all the other guys are zero, then the server is going to go into limbo. It's going to stop cycling. So suppose that when the server gets to here, it finds nobody there, but there's somebody someplace. So the server then simply goes through until it gets to wherever it is that somebody is waiting. Okay, now if that happens, then at the instant it leaves here and jumps to here, let's say, we know that when it registers the next switch point as it passes through here, the number that it finds is exactly the number that was there here because no time has elapsed. Okay, so that means that uh, if this term appears, then this is the probability that the previous switch point was from QI minus 1, that this guy was empty, and that there was somebody waiting someplace else. And so at that time then, at the time that I, uh, I left here, the number here must have been N1, N2, and so forth, because in effect, these guys are going to be exactly the same as these guys. All that happens is that they've shifted over one because the position of the server has changed. OK, now what about, OK, now we've taken care of most of that. Now I've got to worry about the problem that, first of all, this term is only going to appear if at least one of those indices is not 0. So by using this delta notation, I add these things up. And if those things add up to 0, then the delta is a 1. 1 minus 1 is a 0, and this term doesn't appear. But if when I add these things up, they're not all 0, then the delta is going to be 0. 1 minus 0 is a 1, and this term will appear. But it must also be true 
that this term will appear only when this term over here is also zero. Because uh, we know that the instant I left here, there was nobody there, which means that if I switch through to here, let's say, then the number here is still going to be zero. So therefore, that number must be zero. And so to have this term in here only with that number zero, I multiply by this delta. OK, so what this means is that this is just a boundary condition. All I'm doing is specifying that as I write these equations out, uh, uh, this term will appear only for these particular values of the, of the um, uh, vector components that satisfy this so that this is not 0. OK, now finally, there's one other way that I could have gotten to this state. And that is that at the last switch point, the system was completely empty. And the next customer to arrive arrived here, in which case the server immediately switches there. And it spends a one busy period there. And at the end of that one busy period, it, <coughs> it finds N1 waiting here, N2 waiting here, and so forth. OK, so how can that happen? Well. This term right over here is the probability that at a switch point, at the last switch point, that the system was empty. It's, the prob it's a joint probability that the previous switch point was from Q0, uh, uh, Q1, Q2, and so forth. Added up over all the Qs. And the number of customers waiting elsewhere in the system was always 0. OK, so this is what we could call, later I call it this, simply P0, the probability that at a switch point, the system is empty. Now, if it is empty, then lambda i over lambda, where lambda is the sum of the lambdas for the whole system, this is the probability that the next arrival will actually occur at QI, in which case the server then immediately goes to QI and starts to work on that one customer. And the length of time he spends working on that customer at QI is a one busy period. And during that one busy period, I must have exactly N1 arrive here, N2 arrive here, and so forth. That will then bring me to the state right here. OK, that's what this, this product is. It's the product of uh, N1, N2, so forth, each of those being this Poisson probability. OK, so those are my basic equations. Now, all the information is in there. And somehow or other, I've got to get the information out of that. As I say, this looks hopeless. And uh, it amazes me that we were actually able to do this. Because first of all, it's hard enough writing down these, these uh, equations uh, without making a mistake, without overlooking something. Then the algebra that follows this is horrendous. And it doesn't look like there's any hope of success. So if I were doing this today, I would simply write this down, look at this, and say, this is hopeless. Roll up the piece of paper, throw it in the garbage, and that would be the end of it. But at that time, I was either a combination of things. One is I was dumber, and the other is I was hungrier. And so uh, uh, I worked on it. Besides that, I was working at Bell Labs, and I had two jobs to do. One of them was, <coughs> was research, which you did in between the times that you actually did work that earned the money. And I hated that part. So I take any excuse not to do any actual useful work. So research that looked like it was going to lead nowhere was still research. So, so it was better doing that than doing some arithmetic that was going to tell them how many, how many trunks to put in uh, between a pair of cities. So maybe if I, if, uh, if I uh, maybe under other conditions, I never would have bothered with this. But fortunately, all those adverse conditions held. And uh, uh, that made me work it out. I shouldn't say me. It was myself and this other person, Grace Murray, who, uh, after this, moved to the Rand Corporation and switched her field and is working, has been working on other things all this time. Um, OK. So how are you going to solve this? Well, the clue is that what you do is you define a generating function, gi x1 xn. And that would be, obviously, what I want to do is I want to multiply this by x1 to the n1, x2 to the n2, and so forth, and then add them up. So I'll take p1 
P sub I of uh, N1 up through N sub N, X1 to the N1, Xn to the N sub N, summed as N1 runs from 0 to infinity, N sub N runs from 0 to infinity. Now that's um, uh, definition 3. So equation 2, I guess I'm doing things out of order here. Equation 2 in the paper is simply the normalization equation which says that if I take these probabilities and sum them, it must add up to 1. Now the sum, well first of all I have to sum over all the n's, all of these uh, elements as n1 runs from 0 to infinity, n sub n runs from 0 to infinity. In addition, I have to sum it as i runs from 0 to n. Okay, so it's important to recognize that this is not a generating function in the traditional sense in that if I plug in uh, ones for all of the x's, I don't get one because I still have to sum out over i. So it's actually in a sense a partial generating function because it generates the values in here, but it doesn't generate the subscript. Okay, so now what you do is obvious, that is the strategy is obvious. What you do is you multiply through by x1 to the n1, x2 to the n2, and so forth, and sum. The left-hand side, by definition, is the generating function. And the right-hand side, well, now you're going to have to do all that kind of arithmetic that we did earlier for the case of two q's that was symmetric. But remember that when we did that, everything worked out very nicely. So it's conceivable that everything might work out very nicely here too, except that the arithmetic is going to be more difficult. So what I'll do is instead of, although in the paper, it's, it's, it's done this way. In the paper, it's stated equation one, equation two, equation three. Then it says if we introduce, um, uh, combine three and one, then we get, and it writes something out, that's four. And then it says, now, if you then do the arithmetic, that gives you five, and five does, leaves out everything, of course, because this is a paper, and in a paper you leave out all the, um, all the algebra. So there's a lot of work that goes between equation four and equation five. But that work gets complicated because I have all these, remember, I'm, when I multiply by the x's to the powers, I'm going to have to interchange those sums. And the upper limit on these sums, I didn't write these down, this is going to be um, n1 minus k1, and this is going to be n sub n minus k sub n, uh, n minus 1 minus k sub n minus 1. I think, go back here to equation 1. Um, yeah. Uh, is that right? Yeah, n sub n minus 1. No, wait a minute. That's n1, not n1 minus k1. Right. Okay, so let me quickly indicate what's going to happen. I'm going to multiply by x1 to the n1, um, xn to the little n sub n. And then I'm going to sum this as uh, n1 runs from 0 to infinity and so forth, 0 to infinity. So that means that I'm going to have to take these things in here and combine them with these terms and then interchange the orders of summation and integration. And when you do that, the index here is in the upper limit here, so that's going to be complicated, but simple in principle. And of course, the same thing is true here. This term is going to be multiplied by all that stuff. 
And this term is going to be multiplied by all that stuff. And there's going to be multiple summations there and multiple summations there. OK, so now to cut through, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the particular case where there are three Qs and work that out in more detail and go through the arithmetic and then see how it works out. So uh, let's see. I think I'll try and do that up here. So I'll erase this. And now we're going to look at this. Here are three Qs. So this is the simplest, really non-trivial case. So let's call this QI and this QI plus 1. Give myself more room here. QI, QI plus 1, and QI plus 2, which is the same as QI minus 1. And let's assume, we're going to write the prop for the equation for the probability that at a switch point, I have just left Q, QI. So if I've just left QI, then the state is going to be 0 here, because I always leave the Q, because of exhausted service, only when there are no customers waiting. And as soon as I start to serve this, there are going to be N1 here and N2 here. So I'm writing the probability that at a switch point, I'm leaving QI and I find N1 in QI plus 1 and N2 in QI plus 2, which is the same as I minus 1 here. So now I'm, I'm taking this, except that big N is equal to 2. OK, so now let me write out the terms. OK, so what do I have? So first of all, I've got um, the sum as uh, j runs from 1 to infinity. OK, so I'm starting. Let's forget about these guys, because I just put those in there to indicate the generating function. So I'm working with this stuff right here. So first, let me write out the term. Then you'll see what it is. So I've got j runs from 1 to infinity. And k1 runs from 0 to n1. p i minus 1 of j comma k1. Integral. 0 to infinity. OK, before I put in the integral, now what's happening here? OK, this says, this is the probability that uh, at a switch point, I'm leaving this Q. And there are going to be j waiting here. Uh, excuse me. Uh, no, let me say that again. This is the probability that at a switch point, I'm leaving this Q. And when I leave it, I find n1 here and n2 here. That's this probability here. Now, in order for that to happen, one way it could have happened is that at the previous switch point, I was leaving this Q. And when I left that Q, I found j here and k1 here. Now, the j is going to be at least 1 because I'm going to take care of the 0 term separately. OK, so my j is going to run from 1 to infinity. Now, however many I found here, the length of time I spend there is going to be a j busy period. And during that time, if there were k1 here, then uh, uh, n1 must, minus k1 must arrive in order for there to be n1 uh, when I arrive here. OK, so the, that means that the length of time I'm going to spend serving those j guys here is going to be the j fold uh, busy period, the j fold convolution of the busy period at qi. OK, because remember, when I switched from here, I'm assuming that I found the j there and k1 here and k2 here, where k2, of course, must be 0. OK, so that's the state right here. Now, during the time that I spent serving the j guys here and all of their uh, descendants, k1 must have arrived here and n2 must have arrived, uh, excuse me, n1 minus k1 must have arrived here and n2 must have arrived here. OK, so what's the probability of that? 
Well, the probability associated with this Q is lambda sub i plus 1 t. That's the probability during an interval of length t. I have exactly n1 minus k1 arrivals. Okay, so that takes care of the number of arrivals that occur here. And then I must multiply that by the number of arrivals that occur here. That's going to be lambda sub i plus 2 t to the n2 over n2 factorial e to the minus lambda i plus 2 t here. So this term is exactly the same as this term. OK, but maybe it's easier to see. All right, so let me go back over this first term. What's the probability that at a switch point, the switch point is from QI, and there are n1 customers to the, in, the, in the next Q, and n2 customers in the Q after that? Well, one way that can happen is that the previous switch point be from QI minus 1, and the number of customers waiting in the other two queues are J and K1, where J is at least 1, so that I stop here. And if J is at least 1, then I stop here and I spend a busy period, uh, a J busy period, at QI, serving those J customers and all of their uh, descendants. And during that time T, I must have exactly n1 minus k1 arrive here, in which case the k1 that was here will become the n1 that's over here. And I must have exactly n2 guys arrive here, in which case the 0 that was here will become n2. OK, so that term is exactly the same as this term. OK, now we need this term. Plus, here's the probability that the previous Q was QI minus 1. The previous switch point was from QI minus 1. And that at that time, the number of customers waiting there was 0. But the number of customers waiting here was not 0. In which case, what happens is that I will immediately switch through this and start working there. OK, now, if that happens, that is, if this were the state, then immediately the next state would be this state. Because this n1 would move right over here because I would spend no time serving that q. And that number would then become a 0. So that means that it, this term will, will appear only when n1 is not 0 and when n2 is 0. OK, so I multiply by 1 minus delta of n1. So this thing, when n1 is uh, 0, then this term uh, will not appear. But when n1 is not 0, it will appear. And this term must be 0, that's n2. So there's my delta of n2. OK, so now. This term is exactly the same as this term. This term right here. Finally, OK, now we've got to get this term here. The probability that at the last switch point, the system was completely empty is this. This is the probability that the last switch point was from QK. And there was nobody waiting in any of the other Qs. And I add that up over all K, which is from 0 to 2. So that's the probability that at a switch point, the system is completely empty. And if it is, then lambda i over lambda, the sum of the lambdas, is the probability that the first arrival to occur will occur at QI. And if it does occur at QI, then the server immediately goes to QI and spends a one busy period there, D, B, I of T.
a one busy period at QI. And during that time, if it spends a one busy period here, and when it gets done, it's defined N1 here and N2 here, there must be exactly N1 arrivals at QI plus 1 and N2 arrivals at QI plus 2. So that's going to give me lambda I plus 1 T to the N1 over N1 factorial E to the minus lambda I plus 1 T lambda i plus 2 t to the n2 divided by n2 factorial e to the minus lambda i plus 2 t integrated as t runs from 0 to infinity. And that term is exactly the same as this term. Now writing the equations for this case isn't really any easier, I think, than writing the equation for this case. But now when I try and, and solve the equation, it's going to be a lot easier here than it is here. So the strategy next time, what I'm going to do next time, is I'm now going to define, well, I'm going to do the equivalent of 3. I'm going to define g sub i of x1, x2 as the sum of p sub i of n1, n2, x1 to the n1, x2 to the n2 over all n1 running from 0 to infinity and n2 running from 0 to infinity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, this is where I'll start next time. I'll rewrite these equations so there'll be a review in which, I'll, in which I'll state where these terms come from. Then I'll multiply through by x1 to the n1, x2 to the n2, term by term and sum, and then do all of the arithmetic. But the arithmetic will actually turn out to be very fairly simple, and it'll be just like what occurred in the book in the case of two symmetric cues. That is, everything is going to work out very nicely. All the uh, generating functions are going to sum, and you're going to wind up with these integrals, once you bring the sum summation inside, are going to turn out to be Laplace Gilchrist transforms with respect to the um, uh, Laplace Gilchrist transforms, the distribution function of the busy period, evaluated at some strange argument. And then we'll solve the problem from there. OK, are there any questions about this before we quit? Any of these terms I can explain again? What you should do is. Uh, Look at the paper and let me tell you specifically because it turns out in the original paper there are things that, that after that with hindsight weren't really necessary. So let me just tell you what the essence is. Look at equations. Um, let's see, we need equations 1, 3. Okay, I'll write it here. Equation 1 is the basic uh, state equation, the embedded chain. Equation 3 is the definition of the generating function. Equation 5 is what you get from combining 1 and 3 to get an expression for the generating function. And then after that, I'll just write down some numbers here. Okay, I'm going to look at the analog of equation 28. In other words, I'm going to skip a lot of the algebra. I'm just going to look at the main results. So I'm going to look at 28 and 29. And uh, then, although I'm not going to do the work, I'm just going to indicate what could have been done, what was done. Then we'll get to equation 34. And 34 is the main result. And what 34 gives is the expected value of the number of customers waiting in each queue at the switch point. And from that, then we add in the vacation model, and then that uh, can be translated into the waiting times. OK, so if you're going to look at the, at the paper I handed out, just concentrate on these equations, and then I'm going to do them for the special case of three queues. Don't get bogged down in the algebra. Just look at the big picture.
Okay, any questions before we quit? That's it? Okay.